So, my name is Jürgen Olsen Lüge. This is my first talk on single layer marble flow, which will be joint work with Gilles Caron and Boris Wertmann. So the plan of the my talk distribution is for the first talk, just talk about the background of the Yamaba problem, do a crash course on it. And in the second talk, I'll tell you, finally tell you what I mean by single low spaces um, and talk about this existence of the Yamaba flow. And in the final talk, I'll talk about convergence and a bit about the lack thereof. Uh, so let's dive right into it and uh, start with the history. So the Yamaha web problem goes back to Hilbert's search for Einstein metrics. So Hilbert wrote down the following action uh, for a Romanian manifold. Um, so you have a Romanian manifold M, uh, dimension N, that'll be a constant throughout the talk. Um, and S is the scalar curvature of G. Then you fix some lambda, you can think of that as a plus um, a Lagrange multiplier. Um, then if you just naively vary this action, don't care about convergence currently, but just naively vary this action, you'll see that stationary points are given uh, by metrics satisfying this equation, so so-called Einstein metrics. So geometrically, these are sort of interesting metrics, which um, have some kind of special properties, those sort of special metrics, but they're not as special and restrictive as constant section curvature metrics. So it is an ongoing topic to try to find Einstein metrics. Um, now it's kind of hard to try to vary this action because you're supposed to vary amongst all kinds of metrics, so you have lots of degrees of freedom. So it's sort of um, hard to study. So um, we'll change the action a bit. So we'll keep the basic structure. We'll consider an integral of the scale curvature, which is sort of what you have here. And instead of this Lagrange, uh, sorry, instead of this um, Lagrange multiplier, we'll divide by the volume. So this is the first instance of strange uh, combinations of n, which will appear in this talk. They will be strewn across all three talks. You can't really help it. Uh, you shouldn't pay it any mind, but if you want to, want to do the computations, you have to worry about these numbers. So in this case, it just ensures that this quotient is dimensionless. So it's scaling invariant. Okay, so you need to consider this action. Uh, and Yamabe had the um, idea of, instead of trying to vary the Hilbert action or the Einstein Hilbert action, you do a minimax procedure. So you, you consider the action Q, so the integral of scale curvature, and you first, um, for a given metric, you first look for the infimum of that one inside the conformal class. Of so you don't change all, uh, vary the metric arbitrarily, you just look at um, conformal rescaling. So it just means you take the metric and you multiply it by a positive function. So you, the problem solved sort of becomes a scalar problem. So you do that and you get some infimum and then you do a supremum over all metrics. Uh, so this was Yamabe's idea because if you do that, if you have a metric which realizes this sub-inf, then that's actually an Einstein metric. Um, furthermore, if you have a metric which just realizes the infimum, so if the infimum is a minimum, um, then that minimum is actually a constant scalar curvature metric. Uh, so step one of Yamabe's ideas, study this procedure, um, as it often turns out to be in, in mathematics, you have a great idea, it just takes two steps and step one becomes a 20 year research project, which was Yamada's case. Um, but anyway, it, it's a nice question. So Yamada's question is then, can then be formulated as follows. Um, if you have a compact Romanian manifold uh, of dimension at least three or 
in a second by three. Um, can one then find a conformal rescaling of the matrix so that it gets constant scale curvature? So in other words, can you find a positive function such that this conformally rescaled matrix has constant scale curvature? Um, the fact that I do exactly due to this specific power uh, is just a convention. You don't have to think uh, about that at all. Right. Um, so in dimension two, the reason we do at least dimension three, in dimension two, this is known. This is one formulation of the uniformization theorem. But any Riemann surface uh, can be given a constant uh, metric, scalar curvature metric or constant curvature metric in that case after conformal rescaling. Okay, so that's the Amabe problem. I can already tell you it has an affirmative answer. This can always be done. So the, the answer to this is yes. Um, so why is the answer yes? Oh, so what, how do you attack that problem? Well, you first write down what does it even mean to, for the conformally changed metric to have the constant scalar curvature. Uh, and since you already know where this is going, I'm already introducing a so conformal Laplacian, uh, which is just a Laplacian plus the scalar curvature of the metric you start with. Um, and CN is just some, some crazy uh, factor you don't have to care about. And as a uh, slightly long, but you should do it at some point in your life, uh, slightly long exercise in differential geometry or Riemannian geometry, you can show that if you change the metric like this, then the scalar curvature of the change metric is given by this equation. If you can't be bothered, you can also look it up on Wikipedia, but anyway, that's a fact. Um, so asking for the scalar curvature of, of G to be constant just means that this equation has to be satisfied. Where S is a constant, uh, S0 is the scalar curvature of the metric you started with, and U is the positive function you're trying to find. So this is then just a PDE. To be more precise, it's a semilinear elliptic PDE. So it's uh, elliptic because this is a Laplacian. It's semi-linear because there are no factors multiplying, no factors of u multiplying the derivative, but there's a non-linear term here. Um, so it's a sort of the easiest kind of equation after linear to have. Uh, in the special case where s is zero, so if you're trying to go for constant uh, scalar curvature equal to zero, uh, it actually becomes a linear equation, but mostly that's not the case. Um, so this is what you have to do. You have to just solve, show that this semilinear elliptic equation has a positive solution. That's what you have to do to prove that the Yamaha problem has a solution. Um, I won't be dealing with the elliptic problem. I'll deal with, deal with the parabolic problem. But uh, if, when you start doing that, you'll see you, you have a problem. So um, you have sort of sublev embeddings uh, of H1, the sublev space where function and the first derivative is in L2. Uh, that space embeds in LP, but that embedding is not compact for uh, a certain, for P equal to 2n divided by n minus two. Um, and this thing is sort of the critical exponent for this problem. Uh, the the re where you see this is if you take this equation, multiply it by u and integrate by parts. Then on this side, if you do some mental ar arithmetic, you'll see that you have u to the power of this thing. Um, here you can integrate by parts and get the gradient of u squared. And this is essentially um, the L2 norm of, of u because S0 is bounded. Um, so you get a relationship between the LP norm of u with this p and the H1 norm. But um, the relationship for the embedding is not compact. So you sort of get a problem when you try to do things here. Uh, anyway, we're not doing the elliptic problem and you can deal with that problem. You just have to work a bit harder, but it is solvable. So it was solved uh, in sort of step-by-step -step in different 
uh, cases by uh, partially by Yamabe and then Obab found some mistakes in Yamabe's work and, and filled much of the gaps. Uh, and with the contribution by Trudinger and Shane did the final work for uh, positive scalar culture. We'll get back to that in a bit. So the what their combined work shows is that if you have a compact Riemannian manifold of dimension three, then you can always conformally change your metric to get constant scalar coverage. No additional assumptions. Compactness and smoothness, nothing else. We're not claiming the conformal change is unique, but that's another story. Uh, you can always change your metric to get constant scalar coverage um, by conformally rescaling. So this is the elliptic case. Um, so that was done in 84, was Shane's last contribution to that, I think. So in the late 80s, Richard Hamilton came up with another way of looking at the Amado problem, namely as a flow. Um, so he suggested instead of trying to solve that elliptic problem directly, you should solve a parabolic problem. So he introduced an energy, uh, which is um, total scalar curvature essentially uh, of a conformally rescaled metric and you, so you have a constraint namely that you don't want to change the total volume. So if you're keeping track I introduced a functional Q um, so this is the relation between those two um, but if you're not keeping track you don't have to. Um, so this normalization is just um, to avoid silly solutions where you collapse your entire manifold to a point, you increase it to be infinitely large or something silly. Um, so Hamilton then came up with the so-called Yamada flow, where you consider changing geometric uh, as time goes on, and you change it proportional to the scalar curvature. So this is essentially minus scalar curvature times two. You add this extra factor, which is the total scalar curvature, or the average scalar curvature. Uh, since the volume is one, that's the same. Um, the reason you add that is that you get a vo no volume normalization. Uh, so in that case, you get that the volume is fixed. Um, so this is the same Hamilton, which came up with the Ritchie flow, which I wrote down here by hand, uh, because it's more of a side remark. Um, so the Ritchie flow would then be that you change the metric uh, and instead of the scalar curvature, change the proportion to the Ritchie curvature. And instead of this term, you add this term. So it's, it's the same kind of structure. Uh, we add some kind of volume normalization term, um, but it has a more complicated structure because this equation so it allows you to change the metric in any way you want. So this is a tensorial equation, whereas this will turn out to be a scalar equation. This sort of ties back to the discussion of Yamabe's introduction of the um, Yamabe problem to begin with, and namely this flow would converge to an Einstein equation if it converges, um, whereas this one just converges to a constant scalar curve constant scalar curvature metric. Um, so this is sort of a first step in this direction, if you want, according to Yamabe. Um, or you can think of the Yamabe flow as like a baby version of the Ritchie flow. So I said it's a, a scalar equation and that you can see by just writing it out because G isn't arbitrary. G is just a form of rescaling of the initial metric. Um, so if you just then uh, write down what, what I've said so far in terms of the equation, uh, you get this as your uh, PDE. So it's slightly worse in a sense. It's quasi-linear and it's parabolic. So it's quasi-linear because if you look at this term, you can use a product rule and say that this is some power of u times the t derivative of u. So there's some power of u multiplying the t derivative. So it's uh, as a nonlinearity there, 
that turns it into a foster linear equation. But it's parabolic because, well, kind of it's like a heat equation, kind of not, but kind of, kind of is. Um, because you have the like time derivative of the well, power of, a fun of the function, but let's just say it's the function uh, is equal to some stuff, um, but essentially the Laplace function. So it's the heat equation would just be ETU equal Laplace U, but it's, it's close enough to make this parabolic. So the hope is that you solve this equation, uh, starting with the initial condition U equals um, one, uh, so you don't conformly reach rescale at all, you just keep the initial metric. And as t goes to infinity, you hope that the conform factor will converge um, to, to a conform of rescaling with constant scalar curvature. Uh, so there are three questions you have to answer, or three big sections at least you have to answer. So whenever you write down a geometric flow, you have to show it exists. I mean, it's, you can write down whatever PDE you want, but you still have to show that it has solutions. Uh, so what one typically shows is that for finite times, at least it has solutions, but you show a step one. Uh, this essentially follows by parabolicity. You have to will be a bit careful, especially later when I introduce the singular setting, but um, the sort of a meta theorem is that parabolic flows have short time existence. Um, then you have to show step two, which is non-trivial and not always true, uh, depending on the flow, uh, that the flow can be extended to all times. So the Amarbo flow, even for the singular setting in, in talk two, will have the property that you can extend it to all times. The flow always exists for all times. Other geometric flows do not have this property. Famously, the Ricci flow can develop singularities in finite time. Uh, but the uh, Yamaba flow does not do this. But this is the left show. This will be in talk two. Uh, this as well, by the way. Um, and then you have to answer what happens as t goes infinity. So step two says the flow exists for all time, but you still have to take a limit. And crazy things can happen as you take a limit. Uh, so that's uh, talk three, uh, convergence or discussing what can happen as you let t go to infinity. Um, but let me wrap up, up the smooth case. Um, so in the smooth case, um, it was shown by Hamilton first, then Wu Gang Ye, and then Schwedlich and Struve together, and then finally Brendel, different levels of generality on different settings. Then, that if you have a compact from any manifold of dimension at least three, then the amount of flow always exists for all time. Furthermore, depending on additional assumptions, the Yamabe flow will converge. Potentially, after taking sub sequences, I'll get to that on the, on the, in two slides. Before I get to that, I have to tell what the Yamabe constant is. Um, so the short answer is the Yamabe constant is the smallest scalar curvature in a given conformal class. That's not true. It's actually an infimum um, of this functional, which is um, uh, uh, the average scalar curvature. Um, and um, it's, it's, it's Q functional if you want. Um, and it's not necessarily true that an infimum is an infimum. So there might not be a, a metric satisfying this infimum, but it's kind of like the smallest scalar curvature or average scalar curvature, as it should say. And in that spirit, you can also show it's not too hard that this Yamabe constant will be a lower bound of your scalar curve, average scalar curvature for your flow. Um, and it's conformally invariant. I can also show. Uh, so it only depends on the conformal class of G. That's what I'm, why I'm writing it like that. Um, so it turns out that the sign of this sort of tells you what sign of of constant scalar curve, which you can expect if you have one. Um, and if this is non-positive, 
then your mob problem turns out to be quite a lot easier. Uh, and if it's positive, that side kind of corresponds to positive scalar curvature. Um, and as you might know, that's a more intricate question. Um, and in talk two and three, this is the setting we will be discussing, the positive scalar curvature case. So let me wrap, wrap out, up what you can say in this. Uh, compact setting and smooth setting. Um, so if you're aiming for non-positive scalar curvature, then your marble flow always converges, no additional problems, no additional assumptions. Uh, then there are three points about positive um, your marble constants or positive scalar curvature, which are more intricate. So the first result was from 94 by Gauguin Ye, um, where he showed that the Yamaha flow converges if the manifold is locally conformally flat. Uh, it's kind of like uh, sort of saying if the manifold is kind of like a sphere, not quite like a not quite a sphere, but kind of like a sphere in a certain sense. Um, using completely different methods, um, Frederick Struve first, and then shortly after Brendel with similar methods, um, show that. You, you have convergence without this conformally flat distance, but you need additional assumptions. So the first result is by Schwedlik and Struve, uh, which first of all have a dimensional restriction, only works dimension three to five, and you need a bound on the initial energy. You'll see in talk three what this means because we'll have a similar one. Um, so you can't admit arbitrarily large scale of curvature to begin with, and you possibly have, have to take a subsequence. Then the flow converges. So you don't know that u of t converges as t goes to infinity, but you know that u of t n converges as t n goes to infinity where t n is a simple subsequence. Uh, you'll see in talk three what is this. Brendel improved upon these methods quite a bit. Um, so he uh, said that if the positive mass theorem holds, so for instance, by Shane Yao, if you're in dimension three to five, or if you're spin, then you have convergence of the entire flow, not just subsequences. Uh, but you still need uh, some additional restrictions, even in so this is the state of the art. So in the smooth case, uh, it's non-trivial to show that the flow exists, and currently we don't know that, sorry, that the flow converges, and we currently don't know that it converges unconditionally without additional assumptions. So uh, you'll see in talk three what these cases in singular spaces. But for that, we'll in talk two first introduce what singular spaces mean for us, and then the existence of the flow. So if you look at the slides, they should be available online. You can also uh, have some um, additional reading if you're interested. Okay, so see you in talk two, hopefully. <laughs>